Okay, uh, so a couple of disclaimers and apologies. So I'm really pushing the boundaries of conference casual right now because <laughs> despite the fact that I made the trip from Cape Town to celebrate Jeff, uh, my luggage was not as supportive of his career. <laughs> um, so, so I've been, uh, I arrived yesterday and still waiting for my luggage to arrive. Um, I'll say another thing, another dis in the way of disclaimer. Um, oh, I've got some sort of <laughs> live. Uh, <coughs> is there a way to switch that up? There is. Yes. Um, the caption is away. I feel like a little bit of an imposter uh, because this is going to be a non-linguistics talk. Um, but but I, I think it belongs because I think it speaks to Jeff, the Jeff that I know, uh, a, a very skilled philosopher in many ways and a knowledgeable one. And it also speaks to my connection with Jeff. So I've known Jeff probably for the least amount of time, but a large portion of my life. So that still counts. Um, and if anything, I feel like Jeff has taught me to embrace <coughs> imposterhood in some sense. He, he has made me feel confident at times to <coughs> explore philosophical consequences of linguistic theory and cognitive science and mathematical linguistics and various other um, pursuits. So it's in the spirit of, of that connection with, with Jeff that I'm going to uh, talk about some of his work that that emanates from from the model theoretic syntax that uh, that Mark was talking about, but embraces its philosophical consequences. So, for instance, Mark was talking about a lot of this sort of graded grammaticality and uh, neologisms and things like that. And there was another consequence of model theoretic syntax that, that uh, Jeff and, and Barbara Schultz also touted, which was this cardinality neutrality. Uh, and this big issue that everyone here, I am sure, is familiar with in terms of linguistic infinity. And that's the, the area in which I'm going to, uh, the, that's the, the topic I'm going to pursue here. So I'm going to ask, what exactly is linguistic infinity? And I don't think it has a neat uh, answer. And I think that's a problem. And then after that, which this already sort of gives the game away, I'm going to ask, well, maybe if that's not the property we want by itself, then what is, what's the, the related property that we are interested in? And then uh, the uh, Fulham paradox, maybe that's overstating it a little bit, but it sounds cool. Um, <laughs> I'm going to suggest is that you can be even more bold than cardinality about linguistic infinity, and you can actually push the point that it might be a category mistake. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So, I think in my reading of the literature and, uh, and Jeff's work over the years, it's not really that there's one concept of infinity. It seems to be a cluster of concepts, all used sometimes interchangeably. Um, Jeff completely disagrees, he's just <laughs> All used interchangeably um, for various rhetorical means. So we've got the concept of recursion. Lots of arguments have been presented in the way of creativity. There's a relationship here uh, that seems to come across between compositionality and then learnability, which I'll probably say the least about. Okay, so the origin story that you often get in generative linguistics is following Chomsky in some way that the, the advent of recursion theory at the time called computability theory uh, <coughs> really answered something that looked like a paradox before then. And this is sometimes referred to as Humboldt's property um, or attributed to him. It's the idea that language makes infinite use of finite means. And Chomsky 2000, this is the book uh, where he really, in my opinion, does quite a bit of philosophy. He suggests that this property of a physical system to embody uh, an infinite capacity in some way seemed like a contradiction before we had the tools of recursion theory. In, uh, he adds to this, even though that's anachronistic, uh, but 
but you, we all know Chomsky's work is very related in these kinds of ways. He, he tends to write a similar story a number of times over the years. And, uh, and here he says that the advances in the formal sciences, meaning recursion theory, really provided a missing understanding and allowed us to approach various problems and make sense of this Humboldt's property uh, in a scientifically tractable way. And here we have a generative grammar being some sort of finite rule system for the output of infinite expressions or structural descriptions, and we can get into that in the question section if we think there's a difference there, meeting this property. And one way in which it achieves this is by the incorporation of recursive rules. And here, uh, Jeff's 29, the 2011 paper on post-production systems as a, a model of this um, functionality is, is essential. Okay, so what is the essential basic property of natural language that we're talking about? Somewhere along the line, this cluster of concepts became identified with language itself. So you get quotes like this, some basic properties of language are unusual among biological systems, and that's, this is intensified at various moments. They actually say language is just a complete outlier in, in terms of biology. Um, notably, this property of discrete infinity, the, the postillion Platonists, for that phrase, really jump on this. Uh, and, and I'll explain why I think that's folly and why I can understand it in, in a while. Then you get famous sort of Hauser, Chomsky, Fitch, claim about narrow syntax, about the, the faculty of language in this narrow sense, really being uh, essentially about merge or recursion, merge is its latest instantiation. And this faculty yields, yields an infinite, discrete infinity. You've got Andrea Moro, who wrote a couple of books and the papers on the concept of impossible languages. Um, and he really bases the notion of impossibility on, on hierarchical uh, discrete in elements being recursively defined in some way. Uh, so if you don't have that, so linear grammar is really impossible for humans, and this is required. This is something that no animal code possesses. So that seems to be the strength of it. And, and in Pullerman Schultz 2010, there are a number of other examples taken from a number of other books at that time that were really just going heavy duty on this idea that, if, and I get it, that, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I probably have said similar things in grant applications. It just sounds cool. It just sounds like we're really doing something super essential here. Something that's different from everything else. Mathematicians might talk about infinity, but they, there, there are various ways to explain that away. But when we're doing linguistics, we're confronted with this formal property, this infinite hierarchy of structure. So in this article, I think it's uh, on the survey of the literature that I've seen, it's really one of the most thorough investigations of the concept of infinity. And it takes a negative stance. For the purpose, for our purposes, one of the, in terms of that cluster I was talking about, the first cluster is sort of recursion to infinity. And here we get a nice toy example of the fact that recursion doesn't actually give us infinity uh, or discrete infinity automatically. And the toy grammar looks something like this. Uh, I think in the paper you, you say it's modified from, from Andres Kornai's example in, in another source. And here you have non-trivial recursive rules like the VP rule, and you still don't get an infinite uh, output of structural descriptions or expressions or anything like that. So you've got recursion in the grammar, uh, in this context-sensitive grammar, and um, you, uh, you don't get uh, infinite structures from that or infinite expressions. So that's to already cast doubt on this recursion infinity direction, the origin story that I mentioned. Uh, in the paper, they also go further to suggest that maybe when we start talking about this fun, exciting, grant-conferring uh, concept of, of linguistic infinity, then we're naturally led to analogies with the natural numbers, for instance, because we're talking about a countable infinity now. And the, the source of that is going to be something like uh, Arlo Fennell, where we find the natural, the set of natural numbers, or the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. And what's interesting in the paper is that Fulham and Schultz show that this analogy doesn't quite work either, because there just doesn't seem to be an analog of the successor function. 
Um, there's a recent paper by, a, a, I would describe him as a, a Chomskyan linguist, who makes a similar point in that he doesn't think that we can get to discrete infinity by any stepwise manner. And the philosophy, the philosopher Fred Gretzky had a very similar notion of, of the problem of generating an infinity from finite uh, resources. You can't just keep adding finite resources and expect to get to the first level of infinity. Of course, uh, Julian and I were talking a little bit earlier about one of the most, so one of the claims that you get in Pullman Shores is that this is loose talk. No one's actually provided a reasonable proof for discrete infinity. But the most work that has been done has been by uh, Terry Langadoon and Paul Postal, and it also doesn't get you discrete infinity because they happen to think that their proof gives you something more, proper class, the cardinality of a proper class, an uncountable uh, infinity here. So we're, we're really just like, we're in Hilbert's hotel here and we, we're doing <coughs> language work with it. So we, I'll call that Hilbert's language school for now. Um, but that's a, a, an aside to a certain extent that the main takeaway is that recursion isn't certainly going to get us there, and we don't have an analog of, of the successor function, so some sort of stepwise procedure for generating infinity isn't going to work. Okay, but the cluster uh, that I spoke about has a few other possibilities. So maybe recursion doesn't get us there automatically, and that causes some uh, tension with the origin story, but what about creativity? It seems like creativity has been used as a property <coughs> to get us infinity as well. And here the philosopher Gareth Evans, I think, is, is quite uh, instructive. So let's look at, again at Chomsky, who says something <coughs> like, within traditional linguistic theory, it was clearly understood that one of the qualities that all languages have in common is their creative aspect. Thus, an essential property, we like our essential properties of language, is that it provides the means for expressing indefinitely many thoughts and for reacting appropriately in, indefinite, in an indefinite range of new situations. This is very behavioristic for Chomsky, uh, this the description. But that has been taken to mean that something like creativity needs, we, we have this indefinite slash infinite ability to, uh, to creatively construct our language and that needs to be explained with something like infinity. But Evans again provides us with a toy example where he takes two weekly equivalent grammars. One is just a <coughs> sort of a list. We've got axioms or primitives and the other one gives us basic composition rules and constituents. And he says the former, the, the list, is unlike the latter in that it will be unable to predict the speaker's ability to understand in this case period of understanding previously unheard or novel synthesis. So all we need is something compositional here. We just need tools to be able to reconstruct the, the, uh, the complex meaning from its constituents and maybe their syntactic combination. But Evans is very careful to say that although this second system might look generative or creative, it's not infinite and he insists on this because his toy example specifically has only finite uh, possibilities. Uh, a similar kind of example is given in Pullum and Schultz with relation to the haiku example. You've got combinatorics but you have a very largely finite uh, set of possibilities. So we don't get infinity from creativity by itself. I, I'm, been quite quick here, so but let me slow down for a moment and just uh, talk about a slightly more recent um, discussion of this, which I, I found quite interesting. Um, so Samson talks about fixed creativity versus this enlarging creativity, uh, F creativity versus E creativity. The former is just combinatorics. I think he uses the word calculus. It's using the rules to generate novel strings, and. The latter is really rule-breaking and truly innovative. He gives examples like Joyce here, really playing with the rules of language to get at something much more creative. What's interesting is that all of the arguments about creativity and their connection to infinity seem to be more on the side of F-creativity. It's more about using these rule systems 
uh, to understand or generate novel strings. And as we saw with Evans, that really doesn't presuppose any sort of uh, infinite output. You can get that in finite systems, largely finite systems. Okay, so this brings us to a discussion of compositionality. It really seems like, and this is Evans' point as well, that compositionality seems like the kind of thing that we want to use to explain all of these novelty judgments and, and indefinite uh, constructions. And it's and that's somehow being confused <coughs> for infinity. So can we get infinity from compositionality? It seems like it, Evans was, was alluding to this. And there does seem to be an argument which Zabo in his uh, Problems of Compositionality book, which is based on his MIT thesis. I think he did, uh, Belton did that with, with uh, under Bob Stolnecker. Um, so just like down the, the corridor from Chomsky, this was all happening under his nose. Um, and we get this idea that maybe composition and <coughs> compositionality and infinity are linked via some other principle. Let's call that the principle of the novelty of understanding, which is sometimes attributed to Fraser. But Zabo worries that this is just inference to the best explanation, and it's a bad inference to the best explanation because the good ones, if we think so, are either based on our common sense or on what the science tells us, and he thinks that the science on infinite structures and things like that is just not clear enough to give us any sort of inference to the best explanation from compositionality to uh, infinity. What we do get is what he calls a weak principle of understanding, which is something like this. We can understand a complex expression by grasping certain familiar features of the expression and a certain familiar pattern into which these features fit. This might, and there's a, an argument as to whether this implies compositionality, but again, we're not getting anything like uh, infinitude out of our considerations that usually motivate compositionality. In fact, Many of the arguments for infinity, productivity, understanding, novelty, recursive structure, are also used for the principle of compositionality in semantics. But it's a basic truism that compositional systems need not be infinite. We don't even need Evans' toy example to, to see that. Take chess, for, for example. You can have some sort of principle of compositionality where you get the, maybe the individual meanings of pieces, can be defined in terms of their roles that they play, and a finite set of rules because of the structure of the chessboard and the, the movements, that, the licensed movements that can be made. And, and maybe you can base some sort of syntactic analogy on that. But even though the possibilities for chess, again, are just extremely vast, such <coughs> levels, we shouldn't be getting to a point where we tell people who are going to chess competitions that it's a bit boring because surely we already covered most of the, the uh, interesting maneuvers that can be done. We still are not nearly in, in the infinite um, camp. And that's going to be, I think, uh, it's going to fall out of the analysis that I have a little bit later. I said I'll be quick on, on learnability. So interestingly enough, in philosophy and linguistics, you get a, a connection between <coughs> learnability. Um, again, sort of aligning with the compositionality situation. So you have this idea that maybe we have uh, infinite structures that we need to learn, and there's some poverty of stimulus arguments floating around here. So how a language learner Pinker says can correctly generalize from a finite sample of sentences into the context, in context to the infinite set of sentences that define the language from which uh, the sample was drawn. This is really the problem of acquisition. Uh, the idea is that in order to appreciate this infinite capacity for learning new sentences, novelty again, we need some stock, finite stock of primitives organized to compositionality or maybe a generative grammar in the head. But again, this connection only comes about if we assume infinity in the first place. If we assume that the problem of acquisition really is about how we get to an infinite set. And there's really no difference if we assume that the set of sentences in a language that a, a young language learner needs to acquire or acquire a strategy for getting at them is extremely largely finite. So if this cluster of concepts that are so, that is associated 
with linguistic infinity, if you take each one by themselves and they don't equal linguistic infinity, I, I think by the principle of compositionality, I don't think they're gonna do it in tandem or uh, together. <coughs> so what what is going on? Why has this been so persistent? Even despite, I think, Jeff's uh, valiant work to, to quell the tide, to say we do not have sufficient evidence philosophically, logically, or linguistically for this claim that keeps getting made. And I think the reason is that there is a property, a, an interesting property of <coughs> natural language that's floating around uh, beneath the surface here. It doesn't seem like infinity is the explanandum. Although what's interesting in, in my own work, it, it can be an explanand. You can use infinity to smooth the, the target phenomenon to a certain extent. We see this in the sciences quite often. Uh, I think it was Savage who suggested that there's a smoothing function in computer science. You assume that, that uh, the domain is infinite and that cleans up a lot of the mathematical claims. You get this in thermodynamics as well and in population genetics where a population is assumed to be infinite and that actually makes certain kinds of calculations come out, at least in this idealist, idealized model, uh, quite cleanly. So it, it can be used as a tool, but it isn't the thing we're trying to explain. So what is it, the thing that we're trying to uh, explain when we're assuming infinity? Well, I think, and here I'll, I'll, I'll get a little bit hand wavy, uh, did warn you I'm a philosopher posing as a linguist. Um, and I'll say it's something like modal unboundedness. And that seems to be something that is reasonably associated with natural language and not going to fall prey to the worries that I have later. Now you might be wondering, this is all well and good, but well, what's with the scruffy baseballs? And the, the insight here is from Hopkins' State of the Art, 1968, where he really takes on a lot of these sort of early rumblings of Chomsky and infinity that's, uh, that's bombinating in the environment at that time. And he, he asks you to imagine a game of baseball. Um, I don't ask you to do that now, that would put you all to sleep. Um, if I haven't gotten you there already, uh, I thought of changing it to cricket, but I didn't think that would help matters <laughs> much. Um, so given the rules of baseball, and there are many, cricket has even more, I think most people who watch cricket don't even know all the rules. Uh, some of them involve in tea times. And given the rules of baseball, the actual score could always have been higher than it was. I think that's a, a reasonable uh, claim to make about baseball. The game could always have been more boring if it had gone on for longer. And I know some baseball fans not appreciating the, the line here. Like I said, we can substitute cricket in there. The game is still a physical system, even though there's no fixed upper bound on the final score. And I like to think of this, again, because I'm a philosopher, in some sort of modal metaphysics-y term. If, you, if you're watching a game of baseball and it ends at a particular score in the actual world, there's always a, a nearby possible world in which the score is slightly higher, and then the nearby possible world to that where the score is slightly higher than that. And there's not an obvious point at which you can say this is no longer a score uh, for baseball. And I'm hoping that at this point Jeff is already seeing the, the connection between the kinds of arguments that have been used to put infinity forward that he talks about in, in the Pullum and Schultz paper. So in other words, in the same way as there's no way in which to uh, legitimately say that some score is no longer a possible score of baseball, at least if you're moving stepwise, it's similar to saying there's no, uh, that a particular sentence is no longer a sentence of English if you maybe add fairies or something like that. So the problem of infinity I'm suggesting might really be a problem of vagueness or sorority series that's fam familiar from the philosophy of language, or maybe my modal transitive <coughs> uh, accessibility relation stuff um, seemed appealing, I don't know, maybe just for me. So baseball, like a language, is a physical rule-bound system. Usually, also interestingly, not a, a, a direction Hawk had explored, uh, involving coordination, and uh, emergence, but we can just stick to the, the, the physical side of it. There might be some rule-following issues that I can talk about afterwards if, if people are interested as well. 
but we've got a physical rule bound system in the real world that has no fixed upper bound. And I think that's the property of interest in natural language with recursive structures. So what now? Where do we go from here? One way we can find some, awesome. One way we can find some solace is in Jeff's consequence for adopting a model theoretic persuasion in, uh, in syntactic meta theory. So here, MTS might actually be an advantage over the, the kind of structures that have been assumed to be generative and numerative syntax, because as Jeff says, it just doesn't wear its cardinality on its sleeve. It just does not have any of those kinds of consequences. It seems like when you're doing generative grammar and you're taking generative grammar seriously as a, a recursive device, you, so you're bound to assume that what you're generating is a set of all natural la uh, language expressions and only those expressions is going to be discreetly infinite. In fact, Jeff says in 2013, the question I regard as most central in that it arises at a level more abstract than any comparison including rival theories concerns the choice between two ways of conceptualizing grammar. One has its roots in the mathematization of logical proof and string manipulation in the early 20th century, this is the post-production stuff, and the other springs from a somewhat later development in logic, namely model theory. And I think the, it, my interpretation of this argument that comes from this work is that if you have two grammars, both alike in dignity, weakly equivalent or something like that, and one entails a strict cardinality on the target system, makes you uh, have to accept that natural language is discreetly infinite, <coughs> the other does not, then you have some evidence, citrus paribus, to consider this property to be an artifact of the model. And this, I think, is, is uh, Thierry's and Stout and, and my conclusion about this kind of argument. The idea is that we're, we're creating mathematical models to understand a physical phenomenon and the way to sometimes see what shows up as an artifact of the model is by investigating the points at which those grammatical formalisms speak the same language. When they say something additional, that comes up as a question mark and we can ask, is this an artifact of the model or not? But of course, there's a way to go a little bit further if you're philosophically so inclined. There might be an even stronger option, again suggested by Hockett here. Infinitude, or even strict finitude in a mathematical sense, is a property of formal systems, not natural ones. So importing this property to natural, the natural targets of our model might constitute a category mistake, which is basically treating a concept of, or an object as within a logical category to which it does not belong. So I'll conclude by offering some uh, reflection on why this might be a reasonable way to think about infinity. For one, it might explain the persistent obsession with linguistic infinities. Chomskyans have literally needed to change the category of language, what it is, narrow syntax, to something essentially formal. And that's where you get all these claims about like being outside of the natural world or biology, this property of discrete infinity sort of takes it to a different level. And this is what the Platonists jump on, because they say, well, this then means that we, something inconsistent is happening here ontologically. You can't both say that a language is discretely infinite and say that it's a physical system of some sort. But they, they do make a very strange move in that they give up the natural world for the abstract world. They say, well, OK, well, then we should just say languages are infinite. Um, in this way, but they have nothing much to do with the kinds of things that we speak and uh, use for communication. So there's some sort of equivocation on the formal model versus the target, and this is only likely to obscure the science and transmogrify that target. MTS and, and comparative syntactic theory then provides us with a useful tool for dealing with this fallacy by showing us what might be artifacts of the model and what might be real um, features of the target system. So basically the idea is let's leave Gilbert in the hospitality industry and not in the language sciences business. Thank you very much.
comments just how much Barbara Scholes would have liked to hear this. Um, one of the things you didn't come across was the, what I think is a sort of Wittgensteinian character of our view, which is not that linguists have argued there are infinitely many sentences in every natural language and they're wrong, which seems to imply there was a finite number in every language. Right. We wanted to say more, like Ludwig would have said, if you ask that question, you're already confused. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't go there. We wanted it to be a, a matter of an unimportant question that you should never have asked how many sentences are. That's not what syntacticians study. It's the syntacticians study what the structure of the sentences that it, there are is like. They don't study the infinitude, <laughs> if it is an infinitude, of all the ones there are. That's sort of. I, I agree with you, and I think I try to pick up on that. But what what is interesting about your yours and Barbara Schultz's response is that it reminds me a little about, about that debate when, with Scottish independence when I did my PhD out in St. Andrews, <laughs> where the response was, well, should we leave or should we stay? And the stay motivation <coughs> was, I remember the poster song, no thanks. And I thought that was just, it wasn't strong enough. So I, I see what you're saying, the neutrality is really, this is not in the Wittgensteinian sense, a meaningful question. But I think to bring that out more is to suggest that maybe it's even an error, it's a logical error of a category yes. mistake. So, and that's why you can't go ask the question, okay, well then it's finite or anything, because you're just making a, a category mistake when you do that. I did have one thing to oh. ask you, but yeah. no, 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 no. I will leave. Well, I, I think. Uh, a physical, that's, there's an a equivalent question in a completely different domain that I happen to be working in these days, which is, and it's interesting because it was a question to which there was an answer 20 years ago and now there isn't, which is, how many web pages are there? <laughs> okay. um, up until order turn of the century, it was in principle an answer to that question because every web page was actually a file on a machine somewhere. So at any given moment, there were a, a specific number of web pages in the world. And today, that question is incoherent because pages are generated on the fly in response to requests. So you, you have the phenomenon, old-fashioned crawlers fall into what, were, what are known as Turing tar pits. You send a request to a website, you get an answer back, you find links in that, you follow those links, you'll never get out. Right. Right? Like in the old days, of course, it would, you, you were guaranteed either to loop, you'd come back to a page you've been to before, or to stop. You had exhausted all the pages on the website. Can no you, longer true. Am I right in thinking that every time you uh, change the focus in Google Maps, uh, you've actually created a new web page? The, that's why you could send a reference. No, to, actually, that's interestingly false, but, but it would take too long to explain <laughs> it. To explain why. Um, what you, you've got a new view. What you see on the screen is new. Yes. But nothing new came over the wire. Uh -huh. they just, they, and I'll explain that offline. That, that, that's very but if we come back to this, you know, the fundamental point is, we have a physical, there's this physical system, a property in that system changed, and the answerability of the question shifted from being, yeah, in principle, it's 3,357,232,000, et cetera, and now the answer is, I'm sorry. There, Cannot compute. It just doesn't make any sense to ask this question anymore. That's very interesting. I'm going to think about that a little bit more. Uh, Chris? Ryan, this was absolutely wonderful. I, and I have lots of ideas that I want to press on you and lots of questions to ask you about compositionality. I'm really on your side, and I find the modal argument that you made really clarifying. So let me just try to take another perspective. So, like, I. I, I'm actually very curious to know what you think of that language on the coastal books. I don't know what they showed or didn't show, but they do a lot of little thought experiments of saying like, you have a sentence of length n, and you can always put, and it's raining on the n, and your intuition is that that is still gonna be a sense of your language. Right. And that's kind of what you need to get this argument going. Uh, and what they're describing for you is a kind of um, 
intervention-based experiment that you would do to uncover the causal properties of any, any system, right? You, you run a little experiment, and by their methodology, this little experiment was intersecting, and it led you to a conclusion, and the conclusion has a broader conclusion that there are infinitely many sets to What's the problem with that? There's no invocation of a formal system where, you know, we, we can be realist about this and say, like, you interrogated something about the natural world, which was your knowledge of language, and it led you to a conclusion for infinity. Where, where did I go wrong there? Okay, so you're, you're really forcing me uh, out of my, um, my little sheep in wolf's the, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing situation here, because now I'm going to tell you why I think that's wrong, and I, I think I'm going to have to tap into being a strange philosopher for a second. And I, I alluded to it when I mentioned Crispin Wright's paper in that Reflections on Chomsky book. And it takes a Wittgensteinian line to a certain extent to say that we shouldn't, and I feel like in your talk you, you discussed this as well when you're talking about that principle Jeff suggested about how, well, if you can embed once, then in principle you could keep doing it. And Crispin Wright really takes that concept to task. He says there's nothing in the fact that we've discovered this pattern that suggests this pattern goes on infinitely. And his, his reasoning is, is largely based on, on again, the Wittgensteinian principle that gets picked up in Kripke a little bit. So how do we know, for instance, that the rule isn't iterate 50 times and the 51st time, stop, or do go and make yourself a sandwich or something like but that. You know that because you, you suspect it, you ran the experiment, and you knew that that was absurd. But that, but that might have been the, the point of the calculation at which the rules were still well behaved, and you no, just don't know. I think now you're reifying some formal system that I think might as well not exist. I'm just asking you about your own understanding of mm. the language you speak. No so, formal system to worry about here. <laughs> You just imagine this thing for yourself. Does the, does the, and the so, sort of Sir Riety's baseball analogy not help here? Like, sure, I can introspect and I can always add an, an, an additional modifier or something like that, and I can be comfortable that that addition is also part of, it's sort of still clothed in the setting. I still have a sentence of English or something like that. But this is suggesting that they, they might actually be an upper bound somewhere, we just don't know where that point is. There might be a point in the way we get a heap of sand, but we don't know at which point adding that last grain is going to get us there. So that's maybe an unsatisfying response a little bit, but my, I guess my ingrained philosophical skepticism about rule following things like that lead me to this worry that maybe I can introspect and do that, but I'm not thereby guaranteed that this rail leads to infinity, as, as Crispin Wright suggests. Um, and I see Julian's got a hand. I'll say that in answer to your other sub-question, I found uh, Terry Langerdun and, and Paul Bosel's book completely fascinating, and I loved it in my PhD, and I, I read it a few times. And, and Terry still sends me emails with updated versions of where exactly <laughs> in <laughs> the context. Even further, imagine a set like that. Now imagine there was an infinitely long additional set <coughs> tacked onto the end of it. Right, it really <laughs> is. Hilbert's Hotel uh, applied to, to language. Now, Julian has a question, and he had the exact opposite impression of that book, and he's written an excellent uh, paper. I think just like okay, so this one. Well, first, but then I have a question to you. So I go to very late review of Langdon and Bosch. I've never published it, but it's on my web page. Um, I am a set theorist in one of my guises, so I actually understand infinity more than most people do. Right? Um, I also run the intersection experiment upon hundreds of people. So actually people don't believe that infinite language exists. And the more they know about infinity, the less they agree. <laughs> <laughs> so read it if you want. Could be a difference among people. Yeah. Could be. Well, the sort of question I had to you, Ryan, was Hogwarts predated our modern understanding of infinity. If that maxim of his had been translated in an equally valid way, and I imagine language makes unbounded use of bounded means, would anybody have been so excited? No, that, that's a good question. And maybe what I'm trying to urge here is that that's still a fascinating property, and they should still give us grants when we describe <laughs> natural language in that way. But it's just still a, a step further that I think is, is a logical mistake to attribute uh, 
thinking every day. Maybe if he was using the terminology more loosely than what he actually has himself. Had Cantor to explain a little bit more about his thinking. Thank you very much.